And tonight, uh, we're going to have a speaker talk about a, re a technology that, that is utterly revolutionary and that may change. I think it's not an understatement to say that it, if it works, it'll change the history of astronomy. No pressure. Uh, what I'm holding in my hand right now is an example of how a, a change in technology can utterly change human history. This is a mini ball from the American Civil War, from one of the battles of Winchester. And if anybody wants me to talk more about it at the, after the end of tonight's program, I'll be happy to, not on, on, on the internet. And, uh, and tonight's talk also, I think, uh, will lead to uh, possibly, I hope, a change of technology. It will, it sounds like something out of science fiction. When I first, I was turned on to this topic by Gerald McKeegan. And Gerald said, you should look at this. And I looked at it and I was, I went, I was floored. I was flabbergasted that uh, the, uh, that I hope it works because it's absolutely incredible technology. Uh, so uh, I'm going to read the, the normal introduction here. So Edward Balaban is a scientist at NASA Ames Research Center, uh, one of our favorite institutions, by the way, and the NASA principal investigator. That means he's the PI, which means that once this thing goes into space, he'll be the boss. Uh, for the uh, NASA Principal Investigator for the Fluidic Telescope Project. By the way, the acronym is FLUT, very clever. His professional interests include robotics, autonomy, artificial intelligence, and development of innovative space missions. During his years at Ames, he has been involved in a number of R&D and mission projects, including the X-34 Experimental Reusable Space Plane. By the way, really cool. I once gave a radio interview on it. Oh. And... Uh, uh, interviewed by Rebecca Roberts, who's the granddaughter of the Speaker of the House and daughter of Cokie Roberts, if you know who that is. Yeah. And uh, that was, a, uh, I'm, I'm getting off track here. Uh, <laughs> but when, when, I, when don't I get, get off track? Uh, <laughs> Autonomous Robotic Planetary Drill, uh, Drilling Operation for Mars Explorer Project, Exploration Project. I remember that project as well. And the K-11 Planetary Rover Prototype. And he's one of the creators of the, the PSA, the Personal uh, Satellite Assistance, the little robot uh, designed for operating on the ISS, and a predecessor to the current Astro-B robot. And in addition to Flute, he's a leading strategic mission planner for Volatiles, Volatile Investigating Polar Exploration Rover, Viper, which we had a previous talk on, I'm sure you remember, and is a member of Viper's Science Mission Planning. And... Uh, it's Viper, of course, is a mission to land a mobile robot at the South Pole of the Moon in late 2024 to characterize deposits of water ice and other hydrogen-containing volatiles. A very important mission because if we can get this to work, it'll radically change, again, the history of human spaceflight. Um, by the way, when when is it going to launch? Oh, are you uh, making me commit? No, uh, no, no, no. It's just... <laughs> No, uh, the official launch date is still uh, October 20th of this year, but we'll see how it goes. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, if if NASA does things the way they usually do it, it'll be delayed. <laughs> uh, and uh, he holds a bachelor's degree in computer science from the uh, from the George Washington University, I almost called it GW, a master's mm -hmm. degree in EE from Cornell University, which of course is where Carl Sagan was. And a PhD in aeronautics and astronauts from Stanford University. Yay! <laughs> Not that I'm biased. Was Professor Bruschetta there when you were there? Do you remember the name? Bruschetta? Yeah, Professor. No, he must have passed away before. Yeah, yeah he was the, the big guy in Aero Astro at Stanford when I was there. Oh, wonderful man. Oh, did you go to the same department? No, no, not the same department, but mm -hmm. um, I was an undergraduate, but mm -hmm. he, uh, he took us, he took me and my roommate to a talk on Apollo 13. Uh, that was uh, held at NASA Ames by the head of NASA at the time, mm. at NASA Ames at the time, and uh, it was, and I still have the book, and it's just, I, I, we all, I also have a very small role in the rescue of Apollo 13 back in April of 1970. Wow. It's a great story. I'll tell it to you when we're, anyway. I'd love to. Hear. Obviously, senior in high school. Anyway, without any further ado, tonight's speaker, stop laughing. Is that my <laughs> wife laughing at me? Yeah. You're supposed to be respectful. <laughs> okay. Does your wife laugh at you? Never. Okay, good. I, I, uh, yeah, she's okay. very serious. Okay, very good. <laughs> Don't worry, someday your kids will. Uh, anyway, without further ado, Dr. Edward Balaban, give me the talk. I'm very much looking forward to it. There you go. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Yeah. I have too many microphones. Uh, all right. Um, so thank you all for, uh, first of all, inviting me and, and coming to today's talk. Um, Flute is a uh, fairly new project. 
Uh, I think we should display it somehow. Okay. Oh, we have to So, okay. Oh, should we uh, reshare it? Okay. So, Yep, that's better. Okay. All right. So, flute, as Dave uh, introduced it, indeed stands for Fluidic Telescope. It's an acronym that took me about five seconds to come up with. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it caught on after that. Um, and FLUT is a concept for a uh, space-based observatory with a very large aper aperture and segmented liquid primary mirror. Uh, the mirror would be created uh, in space via a novel approach that we call fluidic shaping in microgravity. Um, and what we hope it will result in is a uh, molecularly smooth, self-healing, single-piece mirror uh, that theoretically could lead to uh, telescopes as large as hundreds uh, in, uh, of meters in diameter, maybe even kilometers. So it's, it becomes an engineering problem at, at that point. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, at the hundreds of meters diameter, do you start running into engineering problems, or is there a theoretical limit of a, an absolute? Um, you know, once you get start getting to relativistic sizes, maybe <laughs> you know there is a uh, <laughs> limit. But uh, up until then, the same physics apply. You know, whether it's ten centimeters in diameter or ten kilometers in diameter, so it's. Primarily in an engineering problem. Yeah. So, um, and we hope that, you know, once up in space, Flute can address some of the highest priority objectives of the latest Astro 2020 survey, like um, Earth like exoplanets, uh, early galaxies, and uh, first generation stars. And um, lastly, but very importantly, uh, FLUT is a joint effort between NASA and Technion, uh, Israel Institute of Technology. It's been a collaboration from day one. I'll explain why. Uh, and it's been a great collaboration so far. So uh, first, let's talk about how it all started. Kind of funny story. So uh, this guy played a uh, role a very large role in starting it. Uh, his name is uh, Professor Moran Berkovici, and he is a um, professor in uh, fluid mechanics at Technion. He also happens to be a longtime, very close friend of mine, uh, was even a uh, groomsman at my wedding. Uh, <laughs> so uh, so we, we go way back. And a few years ago, uh, he was visiting with his family, and we went on a uh, family picnic. So uh, we only had one kid at the time. That, that's my daughter there on the right. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, uh, uh, as normal people do at family picnics, we talked about microfluidics. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, <laughs> So he was, yes, Dave. Yeah, that's good. What part? What part? Oh, what part? It was actually um, this long area in Santana Row. Uh, yeah, Santana Row in San Jose. Uh, it's a, uh, 
it's like a shopping center and there is a, a play area for, for the kids and like a lawn area. So we were, we were over there. <laughs> so sure. Um, so yeah, uh, Moran was telling me about the work that his lab is doing, um, uh, in particular about uh, this lab on a chip project that they were working on. Uh, that that's a picture of his lab on a chip where uh, microscopic droplets of fluid would get pushed around through reconfigurable channels for chemical and medical analysis, and they they were pushed around by electromagnetic forces. And as he was telling me that, I I, I had a brain glitch, and I remember blurting out, uh, "Hey, how about we do the same thing?" but in space and build a giant space telescope. True story. So, so he thought naturally that I was having a heat stroke. <laughs> <laughs> so Red, Red Hour brought me a little bit of uh, water. And then, uh, <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. And, uh, you know, using very small words, carefully explained to me that telescopes are big. You know, what, what I'm talking about are micron level, you know, uh, uh, droplets of fluid. But being a nice guy, he humored me and we uh, talked about it some more, uh, you know, and decided this was an idea worth, you know, pursuing. He went back to um, Technion and uh, put a couple of his best postdocs uh on on the task and you know we so the idea the basic idea that we discussed back at that picnic evolved over time and i have to give a lot of credit to his students and postdocs for you know really putting in a lot of effort into maturing the, the initial idea um but you know we at first we were kind of looking over our shoulder all the time expecting somebody to explain to us why we're being stupid <laughs> but uh turn out to be you know a viable idea and let me talk about what the idea is is all about um so this is a droplet of water right on on a uh, glass desk uh, taken by one of uh, moran's students and um if a drop of water is small enough, uh, you know, below about 2.5 millimeters in diameter, then it, the surface tension of the liquid will overcome the forces of gravity and it will retain its spherical shape. And as you all well know, uh, a spherical shape could be a, an optically useful geometry, right? But problem is, once you know you make it larger then this pesky thing called gravity kicks in and uh you know messes things up so um the uh, that's you know one of the few equations i'll show it's a, a capillary length equation for a liquid um and you know as you can see you know the surface tension of a liquid determines uh, in conjunction with uh, the um, density and gravity determines the capillary length of, of a liquid, which is when that liquid will start getting squished by gravity, change, change from its naturally efficient sp spherical shape. Um, so uh, for most liquids, it's about 2.5 millimeters. So if we were to do this on Earth, then only tiny lenses can be created using this approach. So we decided, okay, why, why don't we uh, eliminate the effect of gravity and try this in a neutral buoyancy tank, uh, first in a lab, and, and see if we can make larger um, objects. Uh, Dave, you had a question? No, uh, two, no, capillary length is the breakpoint, right? Where, where uh, 
the uh, where gravity starts overcoming the uh, surface tension forces. Two point five milliamps. Yep. So when we get to ten, then we get a squished uh, droplet. Okay. So. Um, uh, so yeah, we just like astronauts trained in simulated microgravity in the giant uh, swimming pool at Johnson Space Center using neutral buoyancy. You know, these are uh, the first experiments that we did. And um, what we figured out is that by using an immersion liquid of the same density as the liquid that we were um, constructing our optical components with and uh, employing boundary conditions, we can shape uh, liquids into optically interesting shapes. Uh, so simple boundary conditions like planes and you know uh, uh, rings, frames. So let me show you how this works. Uh, this is a quick video uh, of the simplest form uh, that this approach can take. Uh, what you see um, uh, in the video is a simple circular ring-like frame made out of plastic immersed in, into a uh, neutral buoyancy tank. And we inject a uh, liquid polymer into this frame. The only requirement that we need is that that polymer sticks to the frame, right? So that uh, it, it has good adhesion properties to the frame. And um, let me start the video. And as you'll see, the process does not need to be very precise. Um, as long as we inject uh, the right volume of liquid and it wets the inner surface of the frame uh, well enough, once it settles, we get a simple um, convex lens, okay? And that's because um, free surfaces of that liquid still want to take a spherical shape. So they end up being spherical section um, geometry, right? And yeah, that's, uh, you know, the simplest way to create a lens. Yeah, Dave. Uh, in this particular case, it's water mix mixed with glycerin. So we, we use glycerin to try to match the density of that polymer. Um, and if that polymer is uh, curable, so you can solidify it, uh, we can cure it and take it out and we have a, a solid optical component. And that's one of the first things that we did. So that's um, uh, one of the uh, Moraz postdocs, Valeri, uh, who um, you know, really came up with some of the earlier important techniques. And that's a 20 centimeter lens that uh, we made literally in a janitor's bucket because that's the, you know, the thing that we had. And, um, and then uh, we, um, you know, tried other, you know, just by using boundary conditions and uh, different volumes of the liquid, we were quickly able to produce more complex geometries, you know, a spheres, uh, cylindrical saddle, saddle lenses, uh, even bifocals, and also convex and concave uh, lenses as well. So, um, and we also developed models that can predict what the uh, surface of the final optical component is going to be given the uh, boundary conditions. So this is a freeform lens that um, we predicted what the surface is going to be like, and it turned out to be a really good match. Uh, for the prediction. 
Oops. So let's talk about surface quality. Oops, why didn't it advance? Okay, a little bit of a lag. Um, so due to the natural smoothness of liquid interfaces because of that surface tension um, you know, of liquids, the resulting lenses are of a superb optical quality without doing any post-processing, without any effort. Um, so when we, we made that first solidified lens um, in a janitor's bucket, uh, that, the one that Valeri held in front of his face, we stuck it under a uh, digital holography microscope. Right off the bat, we got an RMS uh, root mean square error over the surface of 5.5 .5 nanometers. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, and um, uh, we quickly figured out how to improve that by an order of magnitude, but almost an order of magnitude. And that was by taking the same lens and sticking it under an atomic force macro microscope. <laughs> so it turned out that we were measuring at the measurement limit of that first <laughs> microscope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a very quick fix. <laughs> so what it really was is 0.75 nanometers in surface roughness. <laughs> Uh, on a pretty good size patch. Um, and, you know, just to give you an idea of, uh, so that, that's Valeri, you know, uh, in the lab making a different lens. But um, uh, James Webb telescope mirror is polished to about 20 nanometers on, on average um, RMS. Um, high quality professional precision optics are three to five nanometers. You know, really, really expensive high power laser, laser optics are below one nan nanometer, and it takes a long time to make them and very expensive. Yeah. So, um, we, 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 <laughs> uh, now you know how to make it better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, that, that's one of the big pluses that we see to our approach of uh, just without any hassle post-processing, we get a really high surface quality. Um, so uh, let's get back to this equation uh, really quick. So, so far up to this point, we used neutral buoyancy, right? But then, um, you know, there is another way of getting rid of um, gravity, and that's by going to space. And uh, we decided, okay, let's do that. Uh, so if we create these optical components in space, uh, they could be solidified, uh, but they can also remain in their liquid form. And that also has some uh, big advantages. So it could potentially allow us for that dynamic control of that uh, optical component, for example, changing its focal length. Um, it also, um, so on Earth, we, we still have to deal with, you know, the interface between the immersion liquid and, and the optical liquid, even when solidifying the components. In space, we may get, get an even better surface quality of, of the eventual uh, component because there is no interface to worry about. And uh, finally, if we keep it liquid, then we don't have to worry about uh, micrometeorites and, and damage of that sort. They'll just go right through and the surface will heal by itself. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So uh, some nice uh, properties. Um, so that that's how it started. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Uh, space is not a uniform color. There's sure. lots of different environments. You know, it could be near Earth orbit, it could be in the shadow of the moon, where you're protected from solar radiation, bombarding solar particles. Have you guys thought about what is the optimal environment to construct such a solar system? I'm sure you have. Yeah, I'll get to that. 
<laughs> coming up. Um, so how how has it been going? Um, now we have a pretty large team. <laughs> so uh, only very few people work on this full time. Uh, everybody else kind of chips in little bits of pieces of their time, uh, including me. I, I'm only officially supposed to contribute about 10% of my time on this. Uh, so my day job is very different. As Dave mentioned, I uh, work on uh, Viper, the uh, lunar rover mission. So that's, but it's more like both of them are full-time jobs. <laughs> uh, and um, And what I should mention is that as you by now probably know, I'm not an astronomer or a telescope designer. Just happened to, you know, uh, stumble into the idea. Uh, astronomy is a personal interest for me, right? Uh, and it's, uh, you know, I, I won't go into that, but uh, on as a hobby, you know, I like reading about astronomy, I like going to uh, observatories and so on, but I've never done it professionally. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, uh, and that's how it um, came about for me. Um, but we've assembled a really, really good team uh, with expertise in you know 20 different fields and you kind of need that for a project of this type so everything from um, you know astronomy and astrophysics to optical design to chemistry to structures to uh, you know uh, mechanical systems fluid dynamics so uh, really great team uh, very geographically distributed so we have um, Obviously, our partners uh, in Israel. We um, have colleagues at um, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center uh, that uh, are contributing to our effort. And then we also have um, professors and students from several universities contributing to, to FLUT as well. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about how they are contributing. Yeah, that's good. You know, this is the way science. Yeah, uh, pretty much. Uh, so initially we had no money, right? And then we, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, little by little, we started putting in proposals, funding proposals, you know, with first, our first proposal was an internal NASA uh, Center Innovation Fund proposal. And so, and it was me writing it with Moran and Valeri, right? And and then we got a little bit more money and pulled in more people. And once people got the wind of what we're doing, they started volunteering, you know, can, can I work with you guys? Um, and uh, yeah, so little by little, we built up this team. Some did, yeah, initially at least. And then, you know, we, we tried after a while, after getting a little bit more money, started started to pay them. But but some, yeah, did, uh, and uh, started up as uh, volunteers. Yeah. All right. Actually, I uh, could ask you for some water. Uh, my throat is getting a little bit dry. Thanks so much. So, um, and I, I really have to give a lot of credit to these guys. They um, just been, uh, it's been a very uh, creative, very innovative, um, really well gelled team that uh, allowed us to make really fast pro uh, progress on this. Um, so let me, backtrack a little bit and talk about the technology need that we're trying to solve. So as you well know, uh, performance of space telescopes uh, depends directly on the aperture of a telescope. 
and NASA's long-term astrophysics goals require larger and larger telescopes, but the current approaches are expensive. You all know how much it costs to uh, launch a James Webb telescope um, and take a long time to develop. And generally, you know, uh, we, we can't scale much further um, beyond James Webb without getting to, you know, no pun intended, astronomical costs. Uh, so um, another need that, um, as a side benefit that, that we're pursuing is in-space manufacturing of high quality optics for other types of uses, like, um, you know, uh, Jewish space lasers, sorry. But energy collection, you know, power transmission, uh, uh, scientific, uh, other types of scientific instruments. Um, so uh, the same approach could work for those purposes as well even though our primary thrust is for astronomy. So, you know, this was kind of our plan, you know, when we started uh, technology maturation steps. We started in a lab. Then we decided we want to prove out that this really works in, you know, a, a microgravity environment of parabolic flights. So we did that. Then we decided, okay, well, let's do an ISS experiment. Uh, and we did that as well. And that was all within the first couple of years of starting the project. So uh, when I said we were moving at fast pace, you know, we really were. Um, so our next big, big goal is to uh, launch a uh, small SAT demonstration, technology demonstration mission. And I'm hoping we can do it by the end of this decade. That's what we're kind of shooting for. And then, you know, maybe a year or two later, we'll launch our giant space observatory. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, we, we have a few hurdles to overcome before that. So we, uh, we've been working on different elements of the bigger uh, puzzle. Yeah, question. Yeah. Getting to that. <laughs> no problem. Mm. Um, so, um, you know, so what, what we first wanted to prove is that the fundamentals are sound, that the physics work. And we did that. So what we are working on now is um, identifying suitable mirror liquids uh, and by the way, I, I should have mentioned in the beginning that the same approach works for making lenses and making mirrors. And I'll explain, you know, how that works a little bit later. Um, and then we're working on the um, engineering um, aspects of it, like the liquid deployment met method, the, uh, you know, frame uh, deployment method. Uh, and we've been putting a lot of effort into a modeling pipeline that allows us to predict how the surface of the mirror will get disturbed if we're doing slewing or station keeping, uh, you know, how quickly it will settle after a micrometeorite uh, impact. Um, and also, you know, uh, they've mentioned different parts of space. So how... Uh, uh, you know, going through a changing gravitational field will affect the uh, surface of the mirror. So that that's something that we're uh, currently uh, working on. And uh, I'm not going to go through detail, but this is um, our sequence of uh, experiments that we did. So we did our first parabolic flight experiments in December of 2021. We, we started this project formally just as COVID hit uh, in March of 2020. So, and uh, about a year and a half later, we we're flying our first parabolic flight test. 
then we did our ISS experiments um, a few months after that in April of 2022. Uh, and then uh, half a year after that second set of parabolic flights, we the, the last uh, set got delayed uh, from December of last year uh, because of what was happening in Israel and we, we didn't want our to leave our colleagues behind. Uh, so we uh, moved them to the summer. So we'll be doing them in um, August. So, um, and what we want to do during this upcoming set of parabolic flights is to start proving out our models, our physics models of the surface of, of the mirror. Um, so our first parabolic uh, set of parabolic flights focused no pun intended, <laughs> on, <laughs> on uh, uh, creating lenses. Uh, then we, uh, so I'll show you some, some images. Those lenses um, varied from about one centimeter in diameter to about three centimeters is the largest we created. Then on the ISS, we did a, um, a solidification experiments where we made the lenses uh, out of curable polymers and then uh, cured them with uh, both UV and uh, thermal cure, uh, curing and then brought them back for analysis. Okay, and in the second set of parabolic flights, we uh, experimented with mirrors. So first parabolic flights, lots of fun. Uh, so this is our glamorous team. You guys got to go for the plane. Of course. <laughs> What's the point of doing this if we if we don't go? Yeah, exactly. Yep. So yeah, we were uh, up there on the plane. Yeah. No. Uh, that would have been nice. Uh, we flew out of uh, Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I heard and like, well, we could have done it here. So <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, although our upcoming set of tests, we were actually going to fly them out of Ames, but then uh, logistics. So we'll be flying them out of... Uh, near LA, uh, what is it called, Santa Maria, or some some small airport there. Um, a little bit better than going to Florida. Um, yeah, so each flight is uh, 25 to 30 parabolas. And it, uh, during each parabola, you get about 20 seconds of microgravity, so. Pretty short, sure. and then you uh, you float for twenty seconds. Then you um, you know gets smacked to the to the floor, and then you experience hypergravity as the plane is pulling up. So you you're experiencing about two G's uh, as it's doing that. So um, these were our experimental setups. Uh, we had three almost identical setups because we wanted to take advantage out of every parabola that we had. Um, so this is, <laughs> it probably cost us just a few hundred bucks to construct them uh, each, a lot more in labor. So you can see, you know, we had a very sophisticated fuel, uh, 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 liquid injection system um, on the uh, bottom left. If it, kind of looks to you like a caulking gun that you can find in a Home Depot, you're not wrong. <laughs> so, yeah. yep. And then we wired it to a control module and yeah, so. That was it. And then, huh? <laughs> True story. Yeah. True story. Uh, we still have them. Uh, and then we, we, we use these, what we call aquariums, where we had uh, frames of different diameters with, you know, tubes leading to them. 
Um, and uh, we, we experimented with different types of and viscosities of liquids. Um, and, uh, you know, as we reached microgravity, we would quickly inject the liquid into the frame. A lens would get formed. We would image it, measure it, you know, all in those 20 seconds. Uh, and then, you know, as soon as we um, re-enter gravity, it would splatter inside of this aquarium. And we had about 50 of those aquariums that we would quickly swap out into these uh, setups. And we, we kept, uh, you know, running these experiments. And, you know, I got to tell you that when you are in the, that hypergravity, doing anything, you know, <laughs> um, swapping these, uh, you know, acquirements was a little bit tough. Yeah. Oh yeah, we. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We we even developed our own lingo lingo to you know uh, uh, call out commands right of what who was supposed to do you know everything and we we did practice a lot. So um, and because we we also had there we we could only take five people. And we were running these three setups, you know, at the same time. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, two, two Gs. Yeah. So, um, yep. Uh, so that's that's uh, how it worked. And this is one of the lenses getting formed. Uh, you know, one of the people had to pull the plug uh, literally from uh, uh, the, the tube as we entered gravity because we, we didn't want to let any air bubbles, you know, in. So uh, it all had to be choreographed, right? Just like at the last moment, as the liquid is coming in, we're pulling the plug manually and starting the pump and, uh, you know, and starting the, uh, uh, the camera uh, image taking. And so it was... <laughs> Uh, a, a complex ballet. Um, so that's one of the lenses. And I'll show you a quick video uh, of how it gets formed. So this was measured by a uh, Shaq Hartman sensor, wavefront sensor. So it forms it for a few seconds. It's a perfect spherical shape and then it splatters. <laughs> so, yep. Spherical or was it uh, spherical. Yeah. It, it just a little distorted in this uh, image, uh, the uh, animation. So yeah, then we uh, decided we want to do ISS experiments. And um, we constructed this psychedelic looking device. <laughs> uh, so again, just, you know, a few hundred bucks in materials. Um, it, it's basically, uh, we, 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 uh, I'm not kidding. Our first experiments, we, we bought, um, these, uh, nail polish, uh, um, solidification devices from Amazon for 20 bucks that UV cure, you know, <laughs> liquid nails. <laughs> That's what we, should, and, <laughs> <laughs> uh, optical cement. Yeah, yeah. So uh, one of the most successful liquids that we also sent up to the ISS was this uh, liquid called Vida Rosa uh, that we bought on Amazon uh, that's advertised for making fake, fake jewelry. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what we used. Um, and it's it's very small it's about uh, like this big yeah um well the size of a toaster um so um and this is uh an astronaut making our liquid lenses inside a uh, the one of the space station glove boxes and um again same thing as what you saw in the first video just a simple frame inject the polymer in there, make sure it wets the frame, and then let 
physics to the rest. And uh, this is what it looked like right after making it. And then they got put in, into that UV curing setup and solidified. So that's inside that um, setup. And, you know, uh, about 20, 30 sec seconds later, he would take it out and had solidified lenses. Uh, <laughs> funny story. Uh, so um, the way we were able to do it this quickly is uh, there was this first uh, uh, private mission going to the ISS, the Axiom 1. Uh, and uh, uh, from the Israeli side, so this is a, a, the, uh, his, um, uh, his name is Eitan Stibe, and he was a close friend of Ilan Ramon, who was the first Israeli astronaut who died on Columbia. Yeah. They served together in the Air Force. And he decided, you know, he wants to go to space to and uh, the um, to honor his friend, and he took a bunch of experiments with him. Uh, some of the experiments that you know uh, Ilan Ramon was doing on Columbia. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. When the space shuttle meets Metro over the main area, I would put out broadcast press. Yeah. And when Columbia was going to come in, uh, I looked at the forecast. It's part of the thing over the Bay Area. Yeah. The thing is, though, that it was cloudy. So I believe February 5th, 2003. 2003, yeah. And so uh, I remember going out and uh, looking at the yeah, I wish I'd actually put out the forecast for the first half. Because some people would have seen I went outside in front of my house and I heard the double time phone for the Yeah. And I went inside and I left the television. I didn't get the light. Yeah, I uh, I also went out to to look at it because yeah I knew it was coming over the Bay Area, and I heard that boom and then I was trying to see you know if I can catch it I didn't and same story I I came back and I yeah it, it was just such a shocking yeah yeah. Yeah. He participated in an Israeli attack on the Iraqi. Iraq, Iraq, yeah. Uh, prevented Iraq from having a nuclear weapon. Yeah. He was close to his colleagues. Yes, sir. Yep. Yeah, so uh, I agree. Um, yeah, he was a remarkable guy. And now there is a uh, Ilan Ramon Foundation in Israel dedicated to space exploration. And they partially cons cons sponsored uh, these experiments. Um, so uh, Eitan Stibe volunteered to do our experiment. And that's how we were able to short circuit a lot of the you know, wait time. <laughs> and But NASA, I have to say, was very um, helpful as well. So they cleared up the... Uh, Love box for us, and you know all of our communications were done through NASA and uh, all of the payload processing. So it was really a joint effort. Um, it's uh, in the uh, U.S. segment. Um, uh, forget the module name. Um, yeah, I, I don't remember. Um, but it's the um, uh, yeah. MSG, Microgravity Sciences Glove Box. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, worked really well. And then um, uh, the lenses got returned back to us. And uh, so we measured them and they were, you know, about as we expected. So, uh, worked out uh, great. Oh, uh, this is. The video that I took from uh, the computer monitor as we were interacting with uh, Eitan in real time um, on the ISS as he was making those lenses. I actually had two monitors, so you uh, and there were two cameras. So you're kind of seeing a uh, top view and a side view.
that's it. Wow. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, it's still pretty small. Uh, so about, uh, uh, again, we, we made different sizes, but from about this big to maybe this is the largest, about, I think, five centimeters, maybe. Yeah. To, well, no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. However, what was the strength of the nerve by formed by surface tension forces? Yeah. What about the old idea of spinning the liquid right. and getting parabolic shape? Right. Then, of course, you need gravity, so one can substitute the acceleration. Right. Yeah, so, and that's how people thought we would make, you know, liquid telescopes. But you're absolutely right. You need a force, right, uh, to, to make it work, and you need to spin it. Uh, so, and you need to spin it very precisely, right, at a very precise um, velocity. And in space, you don't have gravity, and you need to accelerate it constantly, right? Um, so, this is simpler. Right, you don't you don't need any extra forces, uh, and you need don't need to spin it. Um, and uh, and then on Earth also, if you make these uh, spinning telescopes, then at some point, Coriolis forces start uh, you know uh, disturbing the. Uh, so on Earth, you can only get them to about. I think six meters before you start getting noticeable Coriolis, Coriolis force uh, effects. And and they do have to look straight up, right? So slewing them is, is a problem. Um, so yeah, they're uh, a little bit limited in their field of view. Of course you can do, um, well, and you can only do parabolic, you could have done uh, what you could, what, what they did with Arecibo and, and moving the uh, detector, right, uh, and use a spherical, uh, you know, uh, surface. But you get a parabolic surface, which, which focuses, you know, at, at a single point. So, uh, yeah, uh, that's why we think that our approach has some advantages. The free surface is spherical, but um, as I showed earlier, if you uh, manipulate the boundary and make a more complex boundary, then you can get a spheres and and uh, uh, variable curvature surfaces as well. But the the basic elements will be spherical because that's the um, uh, that's the natural shape that liquids want to take in, in weightlessness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the simplest form, yes. It, it's, yeah. it strikes me, in response to your question, Steve, it strikes me as being somewhat ironic because the reason we do large telescopes out of mirrors is because of the limitations of fabricating large pieces of glass. Yeah. Right, because 36 inches is about as big as you get on a lens. Here we've got exactly the flip scenario, where it, it's all, you can get the spherical surface, the lens surface, to the sizes you were talking about, where it's much more difficult to do a mirror or a parabolic. Uh, in, in glass here on Earth, but in but it but this. But but this technique, the sky, you know, sky's the limit, right? Yeah. Pardon, pardon the pun. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Getting there. Getting there. Yeah. Very next slide. <laughs> so for the next set of parabolic flights, uh, we decided we're going to make mirrors, um, and um, these are. Uh, the capsules that we use for making mirrors. 
And we experimented with two types of liquids. Um, on the top is liquid gallium uh, capsules. On the bottom are ionic liquids. Um, and if you've never heard of ionic liquids, you know, don't be <laughs> ashamed. Uh, uh, it, they're uh, fairly esoteric things. They're, they're basically like molten salts. Uh, and you, you know, they're becoming more popular because you can engineer them with all sorts of interesting properties. And one of the things that attracted us to ionic liquids is that um, uh, some of them have extremely low freezing temperatures, like 100, uh, minus 180 C. Um, and uh, they, another nice thing about them. Uh, minus 180C. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, and um, another nice thing about them is that they have extremely low um, vac vacuum vapor pressures. So they don't evaporate in vacuum. So uh, we can just leave them in space and very, very little of them will evaporate over over time. Um, but the um, one downside compared to gallium is that they're not very reflective. So we're working on ways of enhancing their reflectivity. Um, but let me go back really quick. I don't know if I have that slide. Uh, OK. Um, I. I uh, I didn't put in that particular slide, but um, let me explain how we can make a mirror. And it's actually not harder than making a lens using this method. In some ways, it's easier. Um, so imagine that ring that I showed you know, in one of the first slides. And we put in that liquid in there. It wets the surface, inner surface of the ring, forms a uh, uh, convex lens. Now imagine sucking out some of that liquid, right? And it will, you know, start shrinking and shrinking until it will get in, uh, become a concave lens, right? Still spherical surfaces, right? Just after some point, it will become concave, right? So if that liquid is reflective, that's already a simple mirror, right? With a concave surface. But we can go further. And imagine you put a plane through, you know, through that um, frame, like you know magicians do with cutting, you know, boxes. Um, if you put a plane, cut cut it with a plane, and then um, the liquid, you know, before the cutting is in equilibrium, right, in, in weightlessness, right. So, you know, it's in a perfectly um, energetically stable state, right? If we cut it with a plane, we can take off the bottom part and the upper part is not gonna know, know the difference, right? So it will still retain that, you know, spherical section, you know, surface, free surface. Now imagine, you know, we have this flat floor. What if we were, you know, to make it more and more spherical, approximating the shape of that surface? The, the the bottom of that yeah so you know eventually we can make it close to uh, the free surface right where we only need a very thin layer of liquid on top of that floor to form a mirror right and you know right now we're planning on having about five millimeters of liquid uh, uh, for our liquid mirror uh, if we have a floor that uh, approximates that spherical shape, right? So that's how we can make a mirror. In reality, so I explained it the long way. In um, reality, if we have that floor and we have a thin lip, you know, around that floor approximating that frame, we can just inject the liquid there, right? As long as it sticks to the floor and sticks to the, that thin frame, it will naturally take that spherical shape. 
Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. We figured that's, you know, that we can deal with. Yeah. Yeah. Precisely. Okay. So th does it make sense how we can get to a mirror uh, with this? Yeah. Spherical mirror. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, correction. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, uh, we, we're just reducing the volume of that liquid. And as long as it's wet, um, you know, the inner surface of that ring, right, then, you know, it will, uh, the capillary forces will keep, keep it, uh, stuck to the to that uh, surface you know and as we suck it out it still wets that full ring but it, then it becomes more and more concave yeah exactly yeah exactly dimple yeah yeah <laughs> yeah Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, and that's how we can get away with, you know, a very, you know, we don't need to get that floor precise because the liquid will compensate for any imperfections of that floor. So, what's the largest size? Uh, you know, I'll talk about our current concept and why we decided on a particular size, but theoretically it can be very, very large uh, kilometers. Yeah. Yeah. No, same, same mirror, single mirror. You, you need to have a large structure, right? But it doesn't need to be precise. It can be very rough. Yeah. And if I'm not attending correctly, yeah. you guys could either make gigantic reflective or gigantic perfection. Yep. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's just yeah. Yeah. Uh the only you know, the main reason why we went with mirrors is because um they require, uh, you know, with that floor technique, a lot less liquid, right? Oh, I think yes, yeah. less weight. Less weight, yeah, and so on. So it, it's more of a practical consideration. True, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, it all now comes together. My master plan. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you you caught me there. <laughs> Yep. Um, okay. So, um, uh, yeah. So, gallium was our first sort of choice of a um, uh, liquid for a mirror because it's beautifully reflective. It's more reflective than mercury. Uh, gallium, if, in case you uh, haven't heard of it, is. Huh? It's a liquid, it's a metal, right? That uh, in pure form, it um, liquefies at about 18 degrees C. So you can hold it in your hand and it'll melt. Um, and um, it uh, is non-toxic, right? So you can buy it on Amazon. We, we did. <laughs> and, uh, but, the downsides is that uh, it's heavy, right? It's a metal. And as we discovered preparing these experiments, uh, it oxidizes like there is no tomorrow. If, if it detects an oxygen molecule within the same zip code, it, it, it sucks it up. So we had to go to great lengths to uh, 
keep it from oxidizing, you know, in our experiments. So it, you can see that the upper capsules are a lot more complex looking than the bottom capsules. Because we, we had these two valves where, you know, we use one valve to purge uh, the capsule with ultra pure nitrogen first, and then immediately, you know, injected uh, gallium in there and then close it off. And uh, it worked, but it was a pain. Um, obviously, in space, oxidation is not, you know, an issue. But preparing it for launch and so on would be, you know, in the quantities that we need, would be difficult. Uh, and plus, you know, as I said, it's it's dense, uh, so uh, we would need uh, to lift a lot more mass for the same volume. Um, yeah. I don't remember either. <laughs> uh, uh, it's similar to mercury, so uh, I good. Yeah, I I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty consistent. It, yeah. So, but we were. Uh, Obviously, with um, IR, you would need to keep it, you know, pretty cold and, and so on. But um, uh, but yeah, we were planning on uh, optical th through, you know, uh, near IR and, you know, near UV type of spectrum. So pretty broad. Okay, um, so this is uh, one of our colleagues monitoring the experiments as we were doing them. And again, we got, you know, really, given the imperfections of that microgravity environment, we, we got pretty close matches to uh, spherical shapes uh, with these mirrors. Um, and we also flew an additional experiment. Uh, we're not going to go in that direction, but we wanted to try it anyway, uh, using atomic layer deposition of a reflective layer on top of an ionic liquid to see if that would work. So it, it worked, but it's uh, more complex than we want to deal with. Um, so, uh, and for the third set of our parabolic flights, we already have the equipment constructed and we'll be um, flying this liquid dynamics experiment where we uh, again use a shock Hartman sensor, but now uh, we introduce disturbances uh, into the mirror surface and uh, measure them and then see how close our models come to uh, matching those predictions. All right, and then uh, we're trying a couple different uh, methods for deploying liquids um, uh, to form a mirror during the next set. And uh, our ISS experiments were pretty good, but not perfect. Uh, so we, we actually discovered some interesting physics uh, during them of polymerization. So we, we'll be following up on that with solidified lenses using you know, a whole range of different techniques during these uh, parabolic flights as well. Okay, any questions on that? So, yeah. I may have just missed it. Yeah. Uh, what is your projected? Getting to. <laughs> so, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm so interested in what your preferred no, no, no. Gallium is a metal. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And how to enhance its reflectivity. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we, we sort of, after the pain that we had to go through with these, uh, you know, uh, parabolic flight experiments, we sort of downgraded gallium and, and and we actually use gallium alloys uh, in that experiment that have 
some better qualities than pure Galio. But we, we sort of put them on the back burner for now and we're focusing on uh, ionic liquids. Okay. So, um, so that was mostly experimental work. Um, uh, last year, we were fortunate to win uh, one of the NASA uh, NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts uh, uh, grants, uh, NIAC. I don't know if you've heard of this program. So it, you know, is very competitive. They usually get about three hundred pr proposals a year. They award uh, about twelve for phase one. Uh, so we got one of them. And uh, it's 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 a very high profile, probably the most high profile NASA funding pro uh, program because it funds really out there kind of ideas. Um, so and it usually gets a lot of publicity, right? So we, uh, you know, I, I gave interviews for you know everything from CNN to Wired magazine, and you know. Uh, and in between. And uh, we got some pretty interesting headlines out of this. So this one was from uh, CNN, sci-fi ideas that could change the future of space exploration. And then the next headline was from the Wired magazine, not sci-fi. <laughs> NASA is funding this, uh, these mind-blowing projects. And then uh, my personal favorite is this one. <laughs> Strangely enough, some uh, some automotive news magazine. <laughs> yeah. Mm. I I haven't checked those. Maybe they published something. So. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So the first phase of NIAC is very small. It's uh, 175K. Um, so uh, yeah, but we, we put it to good use and now we're waiting for the results of phase two should come out any day now. Huh? Yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> so shouldn't be complaining. Um, and that one is larger. It's about six hundred k. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very simple. Uh, by adding or removing some of the liquid. That's all. So, and that will change the curvature. Yeah. So. You will get a per you will get a perfect spherical focus. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, at Rancher's, we had a problem with a spherical candle. The uh, set the optics on the mm -hmm. And uh, at least one of our members uh, actually worked on the optics for a while. Mm. Yeah. If you need some help, oh, thank you. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll ask you. In fact, I think HST itself was constructed in Sunnyvale at the Lockheed yeah. facility. Yeah. Um, so yeah, anyway, uh, so, uh, but, you know, winning a NIAC is more than just money. It does uh, give you a lot of credibility. Yeah. And, uh, so it opened a lot of doors for us and, um, and, you know, uh, uh told people that, you know, these guys might be up to something, <laughs> you know, uh, up to something credible. So, um. We used part of that money to further develop our modeling pipeline. So going from structural requirements to uh, you know those disturbances. 
uh, as I described, to um, the requirements on our adaptive optics, right? So how to correct for that. Um, so we're, we're still working that problem, uh, but we, we got some really promising initial results. Um, and the other thing that we did with that money is work on reflectivity enhancement. And uh, we, so on that, we worked with our colleagues at Goddard uh, Space Flight Center and um, North Carolina State University. So, um, and what we tried is this, you know, pretty clever technique uh, where there is this ionic liquid is mixed with um, this liquid polymer that also UV curable, but it, it doesn't become solid. It becomes more like a gel and it forms at the surface. And we had these reflective nanoparticles embedded in that liquid and they basically get trapped in that polymer matrix and form you know, a pretty smooth reflective layer at the surface of the ionic liquid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So here are uh, gold uh, nanoparticles. And um, the guy who did the experiment, the uh, first thing he imaged was his uh, NASA badge. And, uh, and I looked at it and I'm like, didn't it expire? And so you can, <laughs> you can see that it expired like a month before, you know, <laughs> he did the experiment. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's a great first step. Obviously, there are still a lot of practical things to um, resolve, but, you know, we're, we're hopeful that we can form really good uh, reflective surfaces. Um, and uh, we worked on our uh, technology demonstration mission concepts. So we developed two. One, uh, this is a quote-unquote low cost. Uh, which would be flown on a shared payload uh, bus. Um, and we wouldn't be doing any deployables. Uh, so it would be a fixed uh, frame, mirror frame, and a fixed uh, instrumentation tripod. And then this is a more ambitious free-flying uh, small, uh, small spacecraft concept. Um, cost more money, but uh, allows us to you know, really run longer duration experiments, um, uh, test some of our deployment uh, techniques. Uh, so we'll see, we're, we're kind of working towards that. And uh, with NIAC phase two, we're hoping to flesh out, if we get it, right? Uh, we're hoping to flesh out um, these concepts to the point where we can start proposing them as real missions. Yeah. Uh on yeah. the uh, You have to ask about the cost. <laughs> so the size that we're going for is one meter um, on this one, yeah, uh, on both. And um, we figured that it's a small enough to be practical to do for a relatively small amount of money uh, within the next few years, but still large enough to, you know, be, you know, impressive. You know, launching a one meter space telescope is still, you know, a pretty expensive proposition. Uh, so we estimate that this low cost mission, you know, everything put together uh, would be about $30 million. Uh, and this, baseline cost uh, is about 100 million. Yeah. Sure. Um, molten salts with uh, a mixture of, you know, positive and negative, you know, ions of, uh, yeah. It's what? Water, would you 
Okay, so it's no. going to be hot, hot enough to sort of make the separation possible. Uh, no, no, no. Um, so uh, um, those uh, bath salts, right? Uh, Epsom salt salts, right? Are you know can be considered? You know they're very low um, uh, high viscosity ionic liquids, but they are ionic liquids. But uh, there are others that are um, uh, uh, much. Uh, 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 lower viscosity, so and we can work with those, right? So they they have about you know viscosity of some have viscosity of honey, some are even uh, you know about viscosity of water a little bit more. Viscosity ionically, exactly, exactly. Uh, they take up about this long. Uh, so there are no uh, sort of household names. I can send them to you if you're interested. I can pronounce them. Uh, so, uh, it, sorry? Oh, uh, uh, everything from uh, chlorine to magnesium to... Um, uh, I can't remember all, all of the types that we looked at. Um, I can send them to Dave or Rich and you can distribute them. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So that's one of the things that we're uh, modeling right now. Um, the settling time and the slewing um, uh, motion, you know, what's the highest amplitude disturbance that we're getting from those, right? And, and the time it takes to settle. So the good news that we got uh, earlier this year uh, is, and, and I wish I had, the, I didn't include some of those um, uh, graphs uh, but um, because, you know, uh, uh, what we computed them for is a 50 meters, right? A 50 meter diameter mirror. And we assume that our uh, layer, um, liquid layer is about five millimeters. We, we tried different sizes, uh, anywhere from five to 20 millimeters. But all of them are still considered to be, you know, given the scale. We're, we're in the thin film kind of regime. And <clears throat> turns out it's quite stable to, um, uh, to disturbances, to slewing type disturbances. You know, imagine if you have, um, you know, on the bottom of your coffee cup, just a really thin layer of remaining liquid. You know, you can kind of, shake it right and it'll kind of still stay stuck to the to the bottom of the cup so it's pretty stable so we we did um compute what the disturbance and the largest disturbances would be at the uh towards the edges of of the mirror uh large and they're still like you know on the order of 20 nanometers really? for that yeah yeah um I remember uh, it, it was uh, it was slow but but decent. It was uh, maybe like a couple degrees an hour. Yeah. Uh, so um, uh, I I I can send it to you. I'll, I'll look up the exact numbers. But uh, so it was slow but not unbearable. So it, it was like. Doing a 180 slew would take us like a couple of days. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, now that was calculated for, I think you said 50 meter. 50 meter, yeah. Now, is it a function of size or size? It's the ratio of um, the thickness of the li uh, liquid to diameter. Yeah. So that's, that's what it's the function of. Okay. So, uh, 
we're still not done. We're we're looking at other types of disturbances like um, orbital um, station keeping, you know, accelerations and micrometeorite impacts. We haven't done that yet, but we wanted to do slewing first, right? Because that's you know the biggest disturbance that we'll be dealing with. And uh, yeah, we we were pleasantly surprised that uh, it was it was good. Yeah. If the ring were to no, uh, I mean, uh, you could get nicks, you know, and maybe even holes, but yeah. Yeah. Frame. 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 Yeah. Frame. Yeah. Frame. Right. Yeah. What does no. that mean? The mirror frame broke. If it's a segment and it breaks. Yeah. That would end the pulse. No, unless it breaks off completely. What will happen if, if imagine taking a um, chunk out of, you know, a frame, uh, the frame that we're using. What will happen is that in that particular spot, we'll get a um, an imperfection, right, a dimple. But then as it gets closer to the center, it'll kind of get smoothed out, right? So we may, you know, due to disturbances or due to imperfections of the frame, we may get some unusable area of that mirror. Yeah. Well, we'll have yeah. Yeah, it will have an aberration at, you know, locally. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Uh, I'm guessing. Yeah. I mentioned this to you. That the ideal location for a well, maybe not. Maybe a telescope like this would be at the Lagrange, one of the Lagrange telescope. Yeah. yeah. That's what we ended up with. Uh, you know, we we first looked at, at an Earth trailing orbit, sort of like Kepler. But and it was not a bad option, but just uh, getting this much mass there and and communication issues, you know, with uh, it, you know, going behind the sun and, and so on. Um, and we ended up with L2 and, uh, and some people, you know, initially when we were presenting it, like, but there are a lot of micrometeorites in L2, like, we don't care. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so. So yeah, L2 is our current uh, 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 sort of uh, default place. Um, so uh, what might that 50 meter observatory look like when we're done in a few years? Let me play you a demo, a visualization. Let's see if the sound still works. Oops, I think we lost the sound. Huh? We'll end up with an echo. But... No, but remember we tried it through Zoom and it oh. worked at first. I think when we uh, when I rejoined, I, I didn't enable it. Let me, uh, let me stop sharing and then um, try it again. Uh, hang on. Here. Yeah, I think. Uh... All right, let's try again. The current technologies of monolithic and segmented mirrors for space based observatories are reaching their limit in terms of size due to the constraints imposed by launch vehicle dimensions. The FLUTE project is an international effort to break through these constraints and achieve apertures up to hundreds of meters in diameter. The following animation is an initial concept that envisions a 50-meter diameter space observatory achievable with near-term technologies.
The concept envisions a single launch of a heavy lift space vehicle such as the SpaceX Starship system or the NASA SLS to deliver the telescope to an Earth Sun L2 halo orbit. We assume that the vehicle can be refueled in orbit if required. The system is shown here proceeding to the operational orbit. After arrival, the telescope exits the payload bay and the deployment sequence begins. The first step in the process is to deploy the solar arrays. Next, the sun shield support structure and the instrumentation support structure extend. Once extended, the sun shield deploys. The instrumentation system is then deployed with its tripod support framework. The mirror frame then unfolds. Attached to the frame is a spherical mesh for the floor. The floor helps to minimize the amount of fluid needed for the mirror. The sunshade keeps the mirror in its proper temperature range throughout operations by shielding it from direct sunlight. The liquid is deployed onto the mesh floor. It is deployed from multiple points to speed up the process and to minimize disturbances. As more liquid is added, it adheres to the floor and frame and due to surface tension merges into one continuous smooth and reflective surface. Once the mirror surface is fully formed, the telescope deployment process is complete. Any liquid disturbances that were introduced during the deployment process are allowed to settle and final checkouts and calibration can begin. After commissioning is complete, the flute telescope is operational and will allow scientists to further explore the vastness of the universe and depths of time. <laughs> it's a cake. <laughs> More sophisticated. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a little bit of a backstory of why that. Um, it, it's actually it's actually an AI voice, and uh, and uh, the first one that we tried was a stereotypical American Midwestern, you know, male voice, and the pronunciation of some of the words was just off right so and we decided to hide that by changing that to a foreign language uh, uh, accent you know and this turned out to be the best match <laughs> so, yeah 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 uh, because otherwise half our audience doesn't hear the question. I should have been doing that during the program. Well, I don't know about giving you a microphone during the program. <laughs> do you have do you have a mic, Alan? Yes. The current that's it. I have one that works. Do we not? It might slow down things too much. We'll, talk about. we'll talk about later. Okay. Uh, in the uh, in the video, uh, she talked about. Uh, I refer to her as she. Or yeah. the uh, the stabilization time after the the liquid's ejected. Yeah. About how long are we talking about for a telescope of that size? Yeah, that's that'll be probably when we introduce the most disturbances, right? Uh, injecting the liquid and, and having them 
merge all those patches. Um, we're thinking a couple of days, maybe a few days. Um, so it will all depend on which liquid we ended up, end up with, what our injection system looks like, but uh, on order of days. Oh, here's a great question. Are there any plans once these lenses are cured to use them on Earth to improve eyeglasses? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so our Israeli colleagues actually uh, kind of starting a, a, a startup company uh, to do exactly that. And they, uh, you know, w one of the motivations is to improve we had a slide showing uh, how how many people in the world need sun, uh, glasses and how many actually have them. So, um, and what we envision is a small device, and you know they're working on that device called Lens Maker, where um, you know you can put it in a backpack and go to some remote you know region, and right there and then make custom lenses right for for people for you know literally pennies you know it'll be and just like the tip. current ones the tricky part's going to be the frame yeah right. <laughs> right well yeah yeah but uh yeah you can make prescription lenses you know on the spot right without a uh, complex expensive process yeah yeah great. yeah mm -hmm. Neutral buoyancy, right? So I uh, can use that immersion liquid to, yeah. Um, yeah. I didn't quite understand this question because there really isn't a a uh, a, a manned or um, uh, a flight mission with people on it. So maybe there, um, maybe the question was referring to the parabolic flights. <laughs> um, are there any women on the uh, flight team? Uh, so there weren't on our previous ones. Now that we have a larger team, there will be, uh, so now we have quite a few ladies participating and they will be participating in the parabolic flights as well. All right. Um, I think Alan's question, Alan Agrawal's question got answered. So if there are any other questions from our Zoom audience, uh, now's the time to ask them in the Q&A section. Um, any other questions in the room? Where's your microphone? Did you lose it already? And there's no reason for, at least if I'm understanding this correctly. Is that working? That's much better. There's no reason for curing a telescope that's in space is there? right um or is there so yeah, there could be um and we still haven't completely abandoned that thought and the reason for that is you know main reason is structural stability right so if you imagine um if you get a frame this large um you know and and you slew the telescopes. It'd be uh, telescope. easy to get ultraviolet light curing, right? Yeah, that's true. Yep. Um, so the frame might flex somewhat, right? Uh, especially if you're going through, you know, a changing gravitational field. Um, so th that's one of our requirements on um, the structure to to minimize that flexing, right? But if you cure the mirror, right? Then it uh, really adds to the uh, structural stability, especially given the spherical section, you know, uh, shape. So, but, you know, uh, we, we tried solidifying gallium uh, mirrors and you get into issues like, um, you know, materials shrink or expand when you solidify them. So with gallium, we uh, um, we cooled it, right? And it solidified, but then the frame constrained uh, its uh, expansion. 
and we got a sharp spike in the middle of the mirror. <laughs> so, uh, so there are you know issues with with doing it, and if you're curing an optical component this large, and you need to do it uniformly, right, so that you don't get um, imperfections and aberrations. So there are some challenges to be overcome if we want to uh, uh, solidify them. Also, I don't see a way practically to uh, construct giant refractors. And there's no, is there a reason to construct a refractor? It's going to have some of the same limitations refractors always do, right? In terms of you know, aberration. Aberration. Yeah. 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 So you, you're going to stick with reflected scopes. I think so. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I think you had a question. No. no. Oh. I do have one question. Uh, are you familiar with the years ago? I, I, I don't didn't really follow the progress, but something like Edmund Scientific is, was making liquid cat lens capsules. Capsules. But. Uh, their membranes, membranes, yeah, with focus and things. I don't any of that work. Uh... Yeah, we we'll looked into those too. Um, people have done so. Uh, they would have these um, flexible, transparent membranes, and they would fill them with liquid, right, and uh, form uh, lenses this way. And some of them were even tried out in parabolic flights and. and uh, there, there is a, a group at University of Arizona that that did that, um, and we we contacted them to to see uh, you know learn from their experiences. But the problem is getting to larger sizes. Is well, first of all, you, you can only make lenses. Then you know the membranes can become damaged and wrinkled, and you know in space it's hard to keep them you know pristine. Uh, so yeah, you can do it this way, but there are downsides. Um, but but we we are aware of these efforts. Sure. Oh, I have only one more question for now. <laughs> uh, rough timeline for the 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 small space based what would you call it the test bed and then yeah. the 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 one meter scope. Do you have a rough idea when those would go up? If you if NASA says yes, if all goes well, um, we're hoping by the end of this decade, uh, maybe early twenty thirties, for both? for for the uh, technology demonstration mission. Okay, and then uh, maybe by the end of the twenty thirties, early twenty forties, we'll you know. So I have to take them. really good care of my health. Yes. You you better. You do yeah. too. <laughs> yeah. So uh, who knows? We, we we it might just become a prior. You know, all this considering the usual ways of how space missions get developed and funded. If it all of a sudden becomes a priority, then it might happen quicker. It sort of depends how successful your your next next experiments are. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for speaking with us today. Of course. It was my thank pleasure. You. Great talk. Thank you. That was absolutely mind bending. All right. Everyone, feel free to hang out for a while if you'd like, and uh, we'll be around for a little bit yet. Uh, sorry? Uh, yeah. And the soul poppers that they watch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, you will. How many people in the room do you think have been? on a plane and diving towards the ground like you have. How many people?